Thanks, Mila. I'll start and, and turn over to Richard. Um, so it's a wonderful book and, you know, I agree with everything that's been said. Like Yvonne, I want to suggest that the methodological ambition and contribution is, uh, if not awe-inspiring, pretty close, right? It's an enormously thorough, careful piece of work that has required more hours than one can possibly imagine. So, you know, the method, as you will have discussed, involves a, a mix of earlier work on matching with these event studies that are incredibly careful, uh, that involve really, really interesting, what they call stacked event studies. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how you might build and extend on that uh, in a minute, but really impressive. And of course, then paired with these really detailed case studies that aren't just, you know, sitting in Charlottesville and Chicago, but going and talking to folks and getting a lot of very interesting primary material. I also want to note and praise the degree to which the project uh, tries to code small c constitutional norms as well as capital C and takes seriously the need to disaggregate. So, you know, I have been involved with others on earlier versions of pieces of the book. We had a debate about social rights where we pushed Miller and Adam to think about the difference between directive principles and weak, strong norms, and you do it. And it's wonderful to see in the book the attempt at real nuance in coding stuff that's really tricky and that is hugely laborious and time consuming. And one of the things I admire about um, Chill Steeg, you know, you said famous pairs, that's my claim that, uh, you know, candidate name for you guys. Melkensberg is really an important part of the comparative constitutional canon. So I invite you to claim your um, pair name, but you know, that's my candidate name is Chill Steeg. That is that you guys go back and do stuff, right? You, you do it, you take hours and hours and hours and you do it really well, but people tell you how to do it better and you always do. And I find that part of the really impressive part of your contribution to the field and it's on full view in this book. I also think the hypothesis is extremely interesting. I talked to David Landau earlier this morning to check we weren't repeating ourselves and we kind of are. So I just want to emphasize that I do share the view that he expressed earlier in the day that the line between what's an endogenous and exogenous organizational right is a very fine one. I tend to think that organizations are more endogenous uh, to how the constitution is implemented and that there isn't such a hard distinction between what's an organizational right and what's not. I've told you guys that for years. And I also think it's linked to how absolute the right is in terms of the effect that you find, which is I think some of the rights where you're picking up a strong effect are also more absolute in how they're understood. But nonetheless, I think what you find is real, which is social support structures and organizations clearly matter to how rights are implemented on the ground. And in that sense, I think the book is not only an enormously important methodological advance and contribution, I think it's substantive findings about the way in which rights do get implemented is a really important contribution to the field and a complement to the kind of work by people like McCann and Epp and Siri Gloppin about the support structures for constitutionalism and constitutional litigation. So I think it's a very important substantive as well as methodological contribution. So in the remaining time, I want to talk a bit about how you mesh your large end work and your case studies and suggest what is the kind of the next frontier uh, with Richard in that context. So the way you present the qualitative stuff is we did the large end first, right? And I think you kind of did. And then you said, now we're going to do some qualitative case studies. And the way you present it is you're testing the plausibility of your large end findings. And I think that works, and certainly as a kind of stylistic presentation device, it works really nicely. But what you find when you do your qualitative studies is it's a kind of more complicated story than your initial large end work would have suggested. And I think that's fine, and I think it's really interesting, and it adds nuance, and it adds richness. But I guess the question for those of us who start with small n, right, and want to work outwards is how would one do this project if you started in the opposite direction? So you went to Yangon, you went to uh, you know, Bogota, and then you did some case studies and said, okay, now how are we going to test it? And so here's what I, I got from the Polish and, and Colombian chapters and reading more broadly. And this is kind of my reading of your chapters, not you know, totally what you say, but timing really matters in Poland, right? There's a period of time where 
it doesn't matter so much, then there's a narrow window of opportunity where the PIS are trying to destroy democracy, but the courts are still independent enough to resist, and then it's over. So the only window of real interest is that middle window. And we want to zoom in on a kind of temporal story about sufficient ju judicial independence, sufficient attack, sufficient civil society resistance to figure out whether rights do any work in helping resist democratic erosion. So you would want to constrain the time period of interest quite heavily. Similarly, in your Columbia story, the way you tell it is you say for social rights to mean anything, there has to be this dialogue, there has to be a back and forth in contestation. And you would want to say, well, the strength of civil society is both, you know, something that we think is an explanatory variable and something we need to factor in. And timing again matters. Putting it in the constitution in 91 is not enough. It's the period in which contestation and litigation starts that's of interest. So the question then is how do we start with much more fine grained hypotheses of that kind? that you know, constitutional rights matter under conditions of moderate judicial independence, uh, social movement contestation, and um, a degree of temporal tolerance interval or window of opportunity. And I think that that's kind of the next stage in meshing the large N and the small N to be able to generate large N findings about things that are that fine grained. Because the, the, the stuff that we do on the small N is like that, right? It's not constitutional rights matter or don't matter. It's all about the conditions under which they matter. Um, and therefore one wants to figure out how to do that in a large end way. One of the ways we do that is we gather data. And, you know, again, um, Tom's work, and this is incredibly, you know, foundational. He continues to work with Miller and others in adding to that. Miller and Adam continue to contribute and Miller's ability to win large grants is hugely helpful to coding decisions, right? And other forms of data that allow us to start to test this. And so the first thing to say is we need people like that in the field who keep entrepreneurially developing the data and the, and the ability for us to use that data to make fine grained distinctions of this kind. And the second is we need to build on the agenda that is the kind of panel data matching and then stacked event studies that uh, Miller and Adam use in the book and, and some of the peer reviewed material to really figure out how to do what Ran calls similar cases, but on a large end scale. So Richard, I'll pass over to you to talk about what might be some of the tools and techniques that help us in the next stage of that work. And then I'll um, take it back to wrap up. Great, thanks Rose, let me try and share my screen see if I can do that successfully I have a couple of couple of slides here okay so I, I don't know if people can see that now um great so one way to do what Ros was talking about and it picks up on a number of the other conversations earlier in the day about different approaches to to causal inference as well and you know, many people will already be f familiar with this method and one way to think about it is really an extension of, of what um, Adam and Miller have been doing in moving from sort of from matching to event studies, thinking carefully about differences in differences and so on, and that's synthetic control. And so synthetic controls become a popular method in economics and political science in um, the last 15 years or so. In fact, two of the more distinguished um, economists, Susan Athey and Guido Imbens, described it as the most important method uh, development in causal inference in the last 20 years. Um, and it's really a way of matching together, but in a slightly different way, different, different countries. So here's a, an illustration from a paper by, by Abadie and co-authors, one of the kind of founders of the method, thinking about how would one think about the causal effect of German reunification on West Germany's GDP? Okay, and there's obviously a lot going on, so you can't just look before and after. Um, and you could use a number of other different techniques and, and methods. And what synthetic control does is try and create a synthetic West Germany. Okay, so a, a, a counterfactual synthetic West Germany that didn't go through reunification. And the way they do that is get a bunch of other OECD countries. They end up picking out 16 candidate OECD countries and then essentially let the data 
figure out what weights to put on each of those other countries. So you see in that table down the bottom of the first slide that, you know, Austria gets a 42% weight and Japan gets a 16% weight and the United States gets a 22% weight and so on in making up synthetic West Germany. Australia gets zero, you know, France gets zero and so on. And the de that's a detail as to how that's done, but it's well understood how to, how to do that. Um, and I think that that could be, and so here's what that, here's what that looks like, um, is that um, you see on the, on figure two on the right hand side there, synthetic West Germany, which is the dotted line and actual West Germany, you know, kind of works, right? Pre reunification, they look exactly the same, which is what you'd hope for. Post reunification, this is GDP here, it looks different. And, and what this tells you is there was a causal negative effect of, um, of reunification on West German GDP. Now, lots of other good things about that, but it's an interesting question as to what was the GDP hit. And I think this method is arguably a natural extension of matching and event studies and, and other methods that are being used to try and get at some of the questions in comparative constitutional law. So one thing that I'd note is that the example that I just gave there was a single country um, at a time, and that might be appropriate when looking at um, a, 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 a particular constitutional issue or the granting of a particular right in a particular country at a given point in time, but it easily extends to being able to pull things together. So that, that doesn't make sense in the context of West German reunification, but in the context of thinking about a whole bunch of countries that might have a grant a constitutional right to housing, that does make sense. And one of the things that I think that's nice is you can do both. So you can look at, say, a constitutional right to housing in, I don't know, South Africa, and do synthetic control and say, let's create synthetic South Africa and see what happened to some outcome variable of, of interest. Um, and then you could do it for, for all the countries that had such a thing. And maybe that's one way to think about creating a little bit of a bridge between large N and small N or between the issues of a very particular experience of a given country at a moment in time versus what's generalizable. And, you know, I've been interested to see that um, in journals like the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies, th this synthetic control technique has been started to be used. So Donahue and co-authors use it to um, look at right to carry laws and violent crime. Um, and I, I think it's it's a potentially useful way um, to, to move forward as kind of a next step in, in thinking about uh, empirical comparative constitutional law. Thanks, Richard. So the concluding remark is just, I think that the, the, the amount of the book that um, engages with matching and, you know, Ran's still here, it really is in some ways picking up Ran's, you know, borrowing and engagement from comparative politics with the most similar cases principle. It's the most direct analogue uh, to it. And yet I think that the six months that Miller and Adam spent frustratingly trying to, you know, algorithmically pr proxy the most similar cases principle shows us that that doesn't work, that you actually need really fine grained country knowledge to apply the most similar cases principle that humans are probably better than computers at that actually. But that whenever we do most similar cases analysis as qualitative researchers, we get frustrated because our brains always tell us, yeah, but there's something else going on here. And it's really, it's sort of satisfying, but not fully satisfying. I've just done a paper where I compare um, Charbonneau and Bay in South Africa and India. And I think they're actually pretty close, but you know, I can unpick the way they're different pretty easily. And so I think for those of us who use the most similar cases method in qualitative analysis, I think Miller and Adam show us how to extend it to large N. They show us the benefits of that, but also the limitations of it. And I think synthetic control might be the next step in bridging the qualitative small uh, similar cases method, which I think is a critical part of our field with an equally important large and test of the breadth and generalizability of those findings in a way that is more robust than kind of 
machine learning generated random Lithuania meets Sweden type comparison, but gets at the intuition that Miller and Adam had early on in the project that this was a useful next step in what is a key building block of the field. In, you know, empirically oriented causal comparison has to rely on the principles that Ran identifies in comparative matters. And actually the most similar cases is the most frequently used and important one. And yet it's very hard to generalize into large N and drawing on, on those other studies and Richard's useful explanation of it, our, our view is that synthetic control might be the next step in that. And there's no one better placed than the people on this call. I mean, this is a remarkable conference that you've put together and especially Jill's uh, chill state to extend that method. Talked about it on occasion, but not in much depth. I would love to hear Adams respond at some point, considering he spent six months trying to devise this method for uh, case selection that was based on an algorithm. Uh, but uh, but I guess we should first move on, and then I'll, I'll make sure to to ask Adam for his view. So, uh, Sandy, you're uh, next. Okay. Um, yes. First of all, really deepest thanks. This has been extraordinarily interesting in all sorts of ways. Um, I mentioned this morning that, you know, I'm, I'm scarcely somebody one would expect to see in a grouping of people interested in empirical studies, except with what I think is justifiably broad definition of empirical, like being interested in historical events and the like. So, uh, but not the kind of methodologically rigorous uh, studies that a lot of you do. Um, so I mean, just as Richard began by saying he's trying to think of what to do um, on his leave, I got into this interest in a way because probably 15 years ago or so, somewhat because of becoming less and less interested in American constitutional law for a variety of reasons. I started teaching courses at the University of Texas Law School on comparative constitutional design, including a seminar uh, one semester with Zach. Um, and I, you know, I'll do it again this spring with Victor Ferreris coming in via Zoom from Barcelona. But each year, the syllabus has been quite different in part because quite frankly, I become more and more perplexed about what it is I should be teaching a group of law students, not political science graduate students, but a group of law students, many of whom are taking the courses they freely admit because they're bored with reading cases. And some of them might have majored in political science in undergraduate school, but this is kind of a diversion from the rest of their courses. And so I try to think, okay, what should the syllabus look like? Um, what ought to be compared with what about what? Um, thanks to Victor, especially, we certainly do uh, some aspect of NAC cross-national comparison, but both of us take very seriously Ron's injunction to go beyond the usual suspects. But I have also developed a great interest in recent years in American state constitutions, which are by and large ignored, particularly at elite law schools. And I suspect, though I don't have direct evidence in most political science departments, um, but I think there are a lot of things about American state constitutions that are worth comparing with one another, though not because of rights, um, either because rights have tended to be nationalized via the so-called Bill of Rights or because state constitutions with some exceptions don't vary that much. However, as Emily Zakin, who Mila's co-author has written a terrific book that a number of state constitutions in fact do have interesting rights provisions, including environmental rights, the Montana Constitution of 1972. All states have rights to education. There are other sorts of welfare rights in a few state constitutions. Um, I've written in particular on 
education litigation in the states and what difference that might make. But I would love to see something done with this sort of methodological rigor. Uh, I found this book absolutely fascinating in all sorts of ways. Um, but you know, still trying to figure out what we ought to be teaching our students, in part because, quite frankly, your book reinforced a prior that I already had, going back to my evocation of James Madison a little while ago, that rights provisions tend to be parchment barriers, and at the end of the day are much, much less important than structural provisions. Um, which you know has become my passion with regard to thinking about constitutional reform. Quite frankly, I don't spend much time thinking about what sorts of rights provisions ought to be added to the US Constitution, because I really don't think they're all that important. So I was very heartened, quite literally at the very end of the book, in suggestions for further research that you suggest, well, maybe the next iteration of this kind of large end study should be on structural provisions. Um, I felt a little bit like the very end of Portnoy's complaint where the psychiatrist says, now we may begin that, you know, for me, I really wanna know if it makes a difference that you have presidentialism versus parliamentarianism, uh, that senators serve for six years rather than four years, um, and that, you know, for that matter, does it really make a difference that Texas elects judges and partisan presidents and partisan senates appoint judges? Um, that's certainly part of American exceptionalism that a lot of people from outside of the United States think is an absolutely bizarre feature of the US, maybe it is bizarre, does it make a real difference? Um, and quite frankly, I don't know. Does it make a real difference that a number of countries around the world, as well as roughly half the states, recognize at least some element of popular sovereignty through initiatives and referenda, um, including Australia, as against the US Constitution, which though written in the name of we the people has no space whatsoever for direct democracy. If one is interested in political theory as I am, you know, I've started teaching courses on popular sovereignty. I think that's a really interesting difference between the United States and Switzerland. Does it have operational import I would love to see more work of this sophistication, um, you know, with regard to um, just building a syllabus and trying to figure out what is important and how does one demonstrate its importance against what are just kind of odd features. We do it this way, they do it that way. Does it make a real difference? Either who knows, or by and large, I read your book as saying, no, it really doesn't make much of a difference, except maybe on labor unions and political parties and religion because of the whole organizational context. But otherwise, you know, the most dramatic example is on torture, where you get the negative effect of actually outlawing torture. Denmark isn't gonna to torture whether or not they've got it in the Danish constitution. And as Ona Hathaway pointed out a number of years ago, a lot of very unattractive people think it will get them points in the international community if they throw in an anti-torture provision that they have no intention of complying with. And it turns out the US turns out is in that group, is closer to Uganda than to Denmark in terms of what it's willing to do when it feels national security really to be at stake. The last point, I mean, that my, all of these comments are really autobiographical and perhaps of no interest, but I am brought back increasingly to my days as a graduate student, which is now over 50 years ago, where the major impact 
of looking at a number of issues was to turn me into a nominalist. Very, very suspicious of any generalizations. I remember Lee Benson's book on electoral behavior, where he just smashed the idea that there were farmers, you know, an integrated group of farmers against manufacturers. No, you had to know what the farmers were growing. You had to know their religion. You had to know their ethnicity. You had to know all sorts of things. And by the end of the book, you were talking about Lutheran wheat farmers in a certain area of Wisconsin. And the whole idea that you could do electoral analysis by talking about the farmers was in shambles. It happens to be the case that just this week on the Conwall listserv, there has become a very interesting debate about slavery and the consequences of slavery for the American economy. And why do we have a civil war? If slavery was really capitalist then why didn't Southern capitalist slave owners and Northern capitalist manufacturers agree? Why do we have secession? So a friend of mine sent me a review by Jim Oakes of a bunch of recent, very sophisticated or not so sophisticated as it may be, works examining the relationship between slavery and economic growth, slavery and American political development. And by and large, I really go back 50 years because the feeling I have is that the so-called experts are at each other's throats on these basic issues of how much slavery did or did not contribute to the Southern economy, to the national economy. Uh, and this comes back to the conversation this morning, the methodological problem of, you know, relying on an expert to give you any reliable knowledge at all. And at least in some areas, I, with regard to things I'm interested in, I almost literally have no sense who the experts are. Very last point, with regard to how one defines something as constitutional or unconstitutional. I think it's not an unfair inference from some of the things that Mila in particular said to say, well, it depends on what an apex court would say. You know, do we really believe that except on certain sorts of empirical grounds that what apex courts say is more important than what we say or you know what a district court might say. But if it's a five to four decision of the US Supreme Court or fill in a foreign court that many of you know much more about than I do, where the five are conservative Republican Catholics and the four are moderate to liberal Jews, you know, does the decision of the five establish that some activity is in some deep ontological sense, constitutional or unconstitutional, or do you simply say, well, they had control of the apex court at this particular moment. But if we win an election and if we pack the court, then guess what? Certain things that are constitutional today are gonna be unconstitutional in two years. And the reverse is true as well. So it does seem to me that, you know, the whole issue of what counts as constitutional or unconstitutional requires wrestling either with deep jurisprudential issues or simply recognition that the answer to that question will be very time bound, depending on the politics of who controls the courts at a particular moment. But I wanna conclude by saying this has been an absolutely uh, wonderful day. Even if you don't send me a coffee mug or a t-shirt, I will consider it time immensely well spent. And I'm very, very glad to have read this book.
Yes, and you certainly uh, should get that coffee mug, absolutely. Uh, so, and, and it's great to see that in the last session, we do get to some of the directions for future research, right? Like uh, Ross and Richard's in intervention, can we go from small N to large N or Sandy's intervention? We really need to be looking at structures, which others have said as well. So that's uh, really, uh, really great. Uh, I guess Tom is here now, but I just told Camilo that you, Tom is gonna close us out. So I guess I'll, I'll turn to Camilo and then Tom. Okay, thank you very much, Mila and Adam. Uh, this has been a fantastic uh, day or six months. Uh, <laughs> this has been so long that I don't, I don't, I, I just lost, lost track of, of, of time. Um, I am not um, an empiricist. I, I do not do uh, this kind of work. Um, I'm a constitutional lawyer. So um, take my remarks as the asks of a person that is uh, litigating cases and trying to make this rights real. And that looks very closely to your work and has some questions or, or some of the questions that reading your book I got for, I would say could be for future research, but um, that, that I think would be of interest of people that um, practice on, on these topics. And it's going to be just five points. I'll try to make uh, less than 10 minutes. The first um, thought that I got was, um, what do we understand as not non-compliance? And, and this goes to the point of the nature of the violation. Because one of the things that, that make a lot of noise when I was reading mm -hmm. and comparing the cases was that when you talk about, um, for example, rel religious freedoms and uh, the unions, uh, you cannot have threats to the right and then these organizations and their individuals were able to confront that and to stop that from happening, both in Russia and in, in, in other parts of the world. But the question that I asked myself is that, how fair is this if we compare that to bodily integrity uh, violations in which you don't have that time to react? Um, are, are we comparing the same thing or not? You know, you know, uh, you, you might say, of course, but uh, when, um, when a bill against political parties or, or churches started, they were already organized. But in a way, I think it's, it presents something different. So that nuance or, or you know, that variable in, um, brought me to a bigger issue, which is um, how do we understand non-compliance? Non Someone this morning was saying um, if something if a violation occurs and then um, there is a domestic remedy, that's a, a well-functioning democracy right there. So are we calling that still a, as a violation or a complete violation as if the, the, the event that brought the, the first violation uh, goes unpunished? Uh, is, are we talking about the same thing or, or is there any difference for how we understand that rights matter and how they matter? The second point is um, regarding um, freedom of association and uh, union rights, because as it's understood, I think, um, the right to associate for um, certain labor conditions is an, an special, um, let's say that a soup right of this broader right, which is the freedom of association. And you don't, you don't you at the beginning um, mentioned the idea of, of NGOs that um, are these organizations that are, are trying to fight for you know, other rights, but later when you get to that right, you don't distinguish between the two and you don't present why this form of association is different from others. And some thoughts that I had when I read was first, um, when you're talking about this organizations, you're kind of bringing to the table people that already have certain power. So they exert some power and then they use the right, right? But what is the difference between those powerless, completely powerless and, and these uh, strong unions that you uh, found in Tunisia or these uh, churches like the Orthodox church uh, as compared to you know, some other people that don't have the same power? Is it the right or the power, the political power that they had before having the right? The second is 
the relation between association and identity. It seems to me, specifically when we talk about religion, that the identity that you get and, and the commitment that you get in that form of association might be more powerful than you know, the identity that you get you know, by belonging to any other cultural, political association, right? That matters more, more for, for people. And I was thinking of other uh, identities, uh, collective identities that do not are that are not necessarily associated with rights, or that might be. So, for example, I was thinking of soccer fans. Um, you know that you know they create these powerful identities. There is this very uh, important groups, but they are not supported by, but, and specific human rights or um, weapons enthusiasts. Um, or, or how my wife calls them, weapons, weapons freaks. Um, you know, these people that here in the US, they, they, they have the amendment, but in other countries, it's not the same thing, but they, they're practically religious about these um, things. Uh, and third, uh, and this was an issue that was brought this morning, um, the role of the government, depending the specific, um, fights that you can have in, in the exercise of, of certain rights or, or its limitations. So someone brought this morning, for example, right to education in which you might have, you know, contenders there because you, you might have teachers that don't want to have the kids in person because um, of the risk of, of, of contagion, but then you have parents. So in that way, you have a state that needs to, in a way, have the role of an arbitrator or David also made this point when he talked about right to health. And he said like patients and uh, providers. In that way, it is not the same as the state where um, in the opposition as it is in, 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 in other rights, for example, in, in the receiving end of, of the complaints. Um, and the final point on, on, on this idea is that um, for future research and, and for the future, uh, this topic that is very um, important these days for the discussion, discussions on, on social movements, the differences and complementarities between connective action and collective action. And um, if that makes any difference, for example, in terms of rights that might be individual rights or the exercise might be more individual now or in the past that are now uh, with a, an easier way to collectivize and mobilize people uh, as we are seeing uh, due to um, social media and other um, platforms. Um, my third point um, that I, I, I'm gonna be very brief because Sandy brought it is the, what Roberto Gargarella, call, um, Roberto Gargarella calls as um, the engine of the constitution. And this is this call for looking at uh, Latin American constitutionalism saying that you pay too much attention to rights, uh, but never pay attention to the engine room of the constitution, to institutions, to you know, those specific institutional designs that make uh, that those, constitution, those, those constitutional rights are in the end um, real or not. My fourth thought was about the role of identity creation through constitutionalization of a right. And, and, and I was referring to these cases in which this, the, the struggle of creating the right creates the identity of a group that before that was not, con they, did not they did not consider themselves necessarily as a collective, but they make this, um, this, this, this fight and in the end they create a, 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 um, I'd say a, co a cohesion. Uh, so uh, two um, examples, um, David also brought this this morning, victims' rights um, in Colombia, for example, with IDPs that at the beginning they were individualized victims that they did not consider themselves as a right holders. Uh, but after all of this collective action, they're now, I would say, impressively, not that they got uh, a lot of political power, but they are now a voice that is heard in the country. And, and they were never meant to be a collective. 
uh, but they created an identity by you know, using the constitution and now they have constitutional rights or LGBTQ um, rights in some countries in which the whole struggle creates the idea of an identity, a collective. And my thought about that is that if those rights that are, are gained through this struggle, do they have a better chance of being, of, of you know, taking hold uh, or being considered more uh, part of the democratic discussion than, you know, the, those examples about the Indian constitutions that you had in the end, that, you know, they just um, wrote the constitution based on, on a preformatted form and, and not something that is, um, if one compares, for example, those rights that just came in this uh, kind of, uh, of, of cookie uh, and color um, way, or these that are more um, part of a, of a political struggle if they have more chances to be realized or to mean something uh, beyond the, the, the pages of the constitution. And the last one that is um, similar to what um, um, I think Rosalind was mentioning um, just a few minutes ago is that how to confront total exagnation when, when there is non-compliance at all. And we've tried to do that um, in, 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 for example, in the Latin American region, uh, how to curb um, the lack of accountability for gross human rights violations. You know, for what happened during the dictatorships in, in Argentina, Uruguay, uh, um, Guatemala, and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> what we have found is that, or what we believe is that there are four different variables that mean a lot in the way that in which you can, you know, make a break in the wall, not that you create de facto compliance, you know, general de facto compliance, but you start, you know, breaking the wall and, and you know, creating a possibility for um, um, realizing the right. And what we have found is that um, four, four, four things are important. First, local activism. You need what you uh, mentioned in, in the first part of, of in, the, in the introduction, those organizations, those activists. Second, but with, just with activists, you, you get nowhere. You need international pressure, you know, an international community in that, um, you know, classic view of, of the, um, um, of, of, of Catherine and seeking about, you know, the, the, the model of how you put pressure on, on, on countries. Third, you need legal innovators. Uh, it, that, it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, an indep a complete independent judiciary, but within the, the judiciary, people that are willing to take risks and to read uh, the norms differently. And final, finally, you need um, weak spoilers. You know, the, those who are in power and would be against um, achieving this accountability, for example, that in some point are weak. You don't need to have the fourth, but when you have combinations of those, you see differences in the way that you make rights real. Um, and I wonder if there's any way to support that, that is more um, small n uh, kind of, 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 of approach in a way with uh, the, 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 the data that you have or the data that you can uh, gather in the future. Uh, just uh, to say that I really enjoy uh, reading the book. Um, I, I apologize if, if some of these um, comments are, are too naive. I have to acknowledge, uh, accept that um, my only contribution to, to constitutionalism uh, has been this. I was the one that told Mila the, the joke about the footballer that um, you have it in the chapter of, of the right to health. Um, yeah. But I have enjoyed this very much and, and thank you all, all for, your, for a wonderful uh, day. No, Camila, it's really, we should be the one who should apologize for, our, for being naive most of the time when we write academics books with multi <laughs> mixed methods. So, that, so I, I, it's always really great to hear sort of a practitioner viewpoint on these and, uh, and to make 
to hear that it's not complete nonsense, even though it needs refinement and further research. So that's really great. Thank you. I guess, Tom, you're the last speaker of the day. Uh, you can take the opportunity to do, say whatever you want. I mean, or uh, yeah, the floor is yours. I can say whatever I want. No one's going to listen anyway, so it's perfect. Um, I'm sure you're all tired. No, but it sounds like it's been. Uh, and Richard just got up, so you have some people that are uh, in morning. Oh yeah, morning. Yes, and Stefan, I'm just I can't even believe you're here. So um, are let you me just. Still here. Uh, I'm also. Anyway, let me start. Um, yeah. The so um, the most of this has been about like you know the next stage of research and you know where we should go, and this is actually an old project that uh, Mila and Adam's book spurred me to actually dust off. So it's a sort of two thirds completed book that Zach and I were working on uh, about five years ago um, and just stopped, like we all have these projects. And it's about rights, not about what, whether they work or not, but you know their distribution and where they come from. And sort of uh, the theoretical perspective, I suppose, is this um, idea I have been talking about uh, also mostly unpublished about constitutions as products, thinking them just as uh, Mark was earlier saying about the magic words, why these magic words? And so it's not really about efficacy so much as where they come from. Um, and it turns out that rights are, what, they, what we show, rights are really central to constitutions. We found out of our about 760 in this sample and about 800 now, constitutions written for nation states since 1789, there's only 14 which don't have rights in them. So it has, and, and the, you know, they have become really central to it. The other thing that we do is we look at which of the many provisions that we are coding for are found, you know, the distribution in terms of uh, how, whether they're core or peripheral. So something that's found in almost every constitution like rights will be, you know, a core feature. And then other things like, I don't know, oaths or something might be more peripheral, not central. And um, it's interesting that even the most widely distributed rights are still not at the very core of what makes constitutions. So, you know, constitutions just aren't constitutions unless they have an amendment clause or it turns out citizenship is something about that is in every constitution, head of state selection. These are the real core features. Um, and then of course, rights as a category are core but no particular right rises to the level of being in the top 10 features. And this actually goes back to a point Stephen Garbaum made, Stephen Garbaum made a lot, a lot earlier, uh, which is, you know, we talk a lot about rights, but, you know, that, that they may get a little more attention than they deserve um, in terms of public discourse. They have a political function regardless of their legal efficacy. But, um, you know, the core of constitutions is something else. There is another set of things. Third point, um, we look at the emergence and consolidation of bills of rights. And there's kind of a historical section that's, that's uh, synthetic. Um, but essentially what we show is that, um, you know, rights claims kind of emerge out of very particular political struggles. And the rights that are selected in any particular constitutional scheme, and we go back and look at the uh, the Bill of Rights and all the proposals that were out there for it and what got selected. Um, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, um, you know uh, a, a critical juncture in the path dependency theory. There's all this pol politicking and of course the struggles that are really important to people will help them select from the existing menu. And then you get a Bill of Rights, something like the Bill of Rights or as Zach and I have shown in the other work, the Universal Declaration or um, you know, a critically important constitution like the Mexican one of 1917. And that becomes a menu for the next round. And so there's this sense in which the, uh, the menu of what is being selected, um, you know, is always open. There's a process of selection, choosing off the menu in terms of what's gonna go in the Bill of Rights. Um, and I guess that's another point that the rights tend to come as a bill, as a set, as a section. And we show using our method that um, the position of rights in the constitution has become more central over time, more central in the sense of moving up closer to the beginning. So, uh, you know, typical constitution written today will have like a very, you know, section on state or basic principles and then boom, rights. And that is now the normal way to do it. It wasn't the case in the 19th century. And we can just chart that over time. 
um, that now it's the number two section and that's arisen over time. Um, let's see. Um, what else can I say? Oh, we also look, and this I think is where the products met, uh, metaphor becomes in, at innovations. Innovations and in rights um, or innovations in any part of the constitutional technology of governance. You know, where do we see innovations and when do we see them? And obviously politics has something to do with that in particular political struggles. One of the things we show is that um, if you look at, you know, our survey, it's 117, Mila has some more rights. But what the question we ask is, when do those rights first enter the corpus of constitutions? So it's not that where they're invented, you know, at any level, but when do they get constitutionalized? And that's the kind of innovation, at least we're going to call it that. Um, obviously, you could say, well, that's not the real innovation. But we, you know, when do they cross the juncture to be constitutionalized, where we can analyze their diffusion within the corpus? And um, it turns out, very interestingly, a lot of important rights originate in what we would call the periphery. Um, you know, Latin American constitutions have many more rights than those of any other um, continent. And uh, many of the rights first appear in those early Latin American constitutions, particularly Haiti is a very source of, I think, uh, 10 out of our 117 rights. So, you know, 8% of all rights in our listing start there, which is, I think, somewhat remarkable. Um, and, you know, sort of, but when you think about it from a political perspective, not particularly shocking, right? That rights, you know, languages, if they emerge out of political struggle, might emerge in the periphery if that's where novel, you know, claims are being made. Um, and so that seems like something that's kind of testable in other contexts. Finally, last point that we make here is we look at uh, bills of rights and bills of duties, if you could call them that. And of course, the latter phrase is unfamiliar to you because we don't have them. And the question is, why not? You know, if we could form a bill of rights, why couldn't we form a bill of duties? It turns out that duties are found in many constitutions. About half as many, I think, have duties as rights. And we sort of look at the, the propensity of constitutions in different parts of the world to have bills of rights and duty sections. Um, and we show there that, you know, and this is maybe not that surprising, but they, they do vary by region. East Asian and South Asian constitutions tend to have more, um, excuse me, East Asian constitutions tend to have more duties than rights, which sort of fits this Asian values discourse, which of course those of us who study East Asia always reject as a real uh, description of East Asian political culture, but it's certainly a real description of how constitution makers, you know, um, wheel language, right, and, and, and deploy symbolic concepts. Um, and so that's basically what we're doing, looking at rights and duties over time, um, across space, variation, uh, trying to find out when changes in the products occur, and then ultimately tracking perhaps what might lead them to uh, spread around the world. Now, we wrote this again some time ago. Mila's, you know, already, you know, written five papers or something which describe parts of this world or parts of this elephant, if you can use that uh, old old expression that everyone's grabbing different parts of the elephant. Um, but it still seemed relevant to me in terms of um, asking these questions again with the very sophisticated methods we've all been discussing today. And that's all I'll say. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tom, for uh, giving us more food for thought. So, okay. We have about, about, well, anywhere between five and 20 minutes left, I guess. I mean, I don't know, Adam, about your suggestion of virtual happy hour, but it seems kind of crazy right now uh, crazy. for those of us who've been here for all day. But but I, I do think, or yeah, go ahead. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I had two thoughts to try to wrap or bring some of these ideas together. Um, so I know it's the end of the day. First, I think uh, Tom, the Mecklenburg paper here, the fact that all but 14 out of 770 constitutions have rights is really striking. And also the increase in the number of rights over time. Uh, given that we say they're not that important and others have said maybe they're not that important. Uh, my instinct always has been something uh, along the lines of what uh, Sandy said that I think what part is what people have learned is that maybe giving out rights is low cost and people like them. Uh, but I think along the lines of uh, Alex and Addy's paper that maybe we should actually start realizing maybe there aren't just free goodies and there are costs associated with um, giving out rights that, that there could be backlash or, um, you know, fatigue or, or um, backlash, which also gets at uh, Charles and Kevin's paper. Uh, 
second thought uh, I had is, um, this relates to Camilo and others points. Mila and I met, uh, Mila had just written a paper on sham constitutions, pointing out all of the gaps between de facto and de jure rights. And I had been working on the international law literature saying that a lot of international treaties don't work very well. And we've now spent seven years on a part of a constitution that our prior was doesn't matter very much. Um, uh, I, my hope is that, uh, that the next seven years, we can use some of the better methods that we've learned along the way and some of the methods that Ross and Richard and others are outlining that are the next step uh, to focus in on the, on the parts of the constitutions where our priors are that they do matter uh, and have a, perhaps a more constructive project. And I, I hope that that's the, the way to go as, as Sandy and Camilo and others said, the, the yeah. structural pieces that might be most important. All right, that's the end of the thoughts I had. There's a lot on the table. Go ahead. I, I love to hear others talk. Raz, were you speaking? Or who was speaking? No, no, I was just typing in the chat. Yeah, uh, I was going to intervene I, I hope briefly that <clears throat> one takeaway I got from the book is that in as much as rights encourage litigation, they have a rights provisions encourage litigation, then they might have a negative effect on political organization that might in fact be much more effective. So that, you know, there is, I think now a genuine debate about whether Roe versus Wade was all that much a victory for the women's rights movement in as much as it fed a Warren Court era confidence that we would always have the apex courts and political organization was decidedly secondary and it's the right wing that organized politically in opposition to Roe and they're getting Amy Barrett on Monday. And so it does make me wonder exactly why one would put immense amounts of energy into you know, putting rights provisions in a constitution rather than political organization and political pressure. Great, uh, Mark, Mark Tushnitz. Welcome back, Mark. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry I missed a, a chunk of this session. Um, on, uh, this is actually most directly relevant to Tom's paper, but also more generally, um, occurred to me that um, that it would be interesting to have a study uh, of what Frankenberg calls the Ikeaization phenomenon, which is not, not uh, having the same thing in every constitution, but actually sort of going to Ikea to buy a freedom of religion provision and then localizing it uh, uh, for your particular circumstances. Um, and that's, I just go back to something I said this morning, that's different from the limitations clause uh, idea. Um, and I have no idea uh, what it would show. Uh, I mean, I, I have a very strong intuition that Frankenberg's idea is right, but, um, and it, it does seem to me that, um, the, looking at the words in the Constitution is exactly what you'd be looking for for Ikeaization. Um, but I have no idea at, how to go about doing it or whether it would be productive or not. Is there anyone else who wants to put some concluding thoughts on the table for the day? I mean, especially those of you who've been here for multiple sessions and heard. I, I, I personally think it's great that we've heard both new proposals for methods, including like the synthetic control method, which really I think we should, I agree that we should be thinking uh, about for new, for challenges 
create calls for better data, more fine grade data, thinking about how we can go from 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 small n to large n and explore more scope conditions. I've heard proposals for new questions. So there's just a lot to respond to, but I, I would love to, you know, give everybody a few more minutes if you want. Uh, we can also just wrap it up. But if anybody has some other closing thoughts. Rand, I see Ron has a question. Um, let me just say one word to Mark, which I think it is a great idea, but it gets actually your limitations clause point, I think is relevant here because, you know, basically you're sort of saying, well, how, what is the meaning in any different local context? Um, uh, and that, that, that strikes me as, you know, requiring really the in-depth kind of understanding of each particular jurisdiction, which is really hard to measure. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ron? Well, it's uh, the end of an excellent but long day. Um, following Mark Tushnet's uh, comment, I just wanted to ask Mark. So those of us who are familiar with Mark's work in the 80s, you know, the critical legal studies phase in Mark Tushnet's life, uh, in his famous essay on rights, I think this is, this is what, 1980-some, 84, I could be wrong. And then that triggered a sort of right-wing critique from Glendon and all these, you know, uh, these people on um, how rights um, advance an individualist, atomistic, anti-communitarian uh, sense of society. And, um, you know, and Jeremy Waldron jumped on this back in the late 80s. Now, you know, 30, 35 years later, following this book and all the literature on the utility of rights. Uh, what's your take on the whole issue of rights? Is that a good thing, a bad thing? It's a big question. I'm not expecting an answer, but maybe it's a good, but maybe it's a good way to end an amazing conference and, and, and to congratulate Mila and Adam on a fantastic work. Again, comparative constitutional studies at its best. Uh, and long food for thought for the weekend. Uh, great, Mark. Do you want to do you want to respond uh, to, to just as concluding uh, words for the conference or? So, so I, I mean, at some level, yeah. Um, um, my basic answer is it, it all depends, um, <laughs> and uh, that's why I am, as you can tell, uh, clearly. Uh, uh, on the side of making, making the studies in the field as nuanced and complexified as possible, which is in some tension with the uh, um, quantitative elements of what are being called empirical studies. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, on the words, it all depends. It all depends seems like a good way to end uh, to end a conference where we're trying to get a causal inference. I don't know. Uh, you, we can draw our conclusions from that. Uh, I think it was great to have you all here. There's a lot of. I will, I'll be following up with some of you on some of your comments for sure. Uh, Adam, I don't know if you want to add. Thanks anything. everyone for coming. Really appreciate that we could still have it. This send time. you the, the addresses for the coffee mugs. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's on Adam, but I do yeah. think University of Chicago Law School uh, should be the one sending out the mugs. 